Doppler shift can be described as a uh, shift in the uh, frequency. So it depends on the context. When you're talking about audio sound waves, uh, you can talk about shift in the pitch, um, the frequency that you hear of sound. Uh, that depends on the motion of either the sound source or the observer. Um, and Doppler shift comes up also in other con context of other traveling waves, like visible light is a traveling wave, electromagnetic wave. And we talk about Doppler shift of light as well. Uh, in that context, we talk about red shift and blue shift. Um, that's the astronomy context. And um, so that's a, in the very big picture terms, that's what Doppler shift is referring to. Shift in frequency or wavelength of a traveling wave that depends on the motion of the source or observer. As I was preparing for this session, I found a simulation um, that can be used to illustrate um, where Doppler shift comes from and what are the uh, factors that affect it. So let me just uh, open a new window. And I think when I searched for Doppler um, simulation, it showed up as one of the top results. So yeah, it's this one. So let me use this simulation to talk about, uh, let me use this simulation to visualize a Doppler effect. So it's a, a simple simulation. It, by default, this sets up a situation with the source and the observer at rest. And um, it has some frequency of um, emitted sound waves and some frequency at which it's observed. So let me just play, then you will see um, what the simulation uh, uh, visualizes. It's visualizing this. Those uh, pulsing, outgoing, circular waves. You can imagine them as um, wave front of a sound wave. And uh, so, I mean, this is... So imagine this is a very slow motion version of it. So this is, um, well, I guess there are different ways to imagine it. But um, so if uh, spacing between these uh, somehow correspond to 100 hertz, then as the sound waves reach the observer, then um, the spacing remains the same. So the observer will hear it at 100 hertz. Now let's change the parameters of simulation a little bit. So we could make it so that the, the sound source is moving. Uh, when the sound source is moving, watch what happens. So uh, before that, let me just play it for a while again so that you get a sense of the kind of the rhythm of uh, these waves being emitted. So it's the rhythm at which wave is being emitted. And I'm going to have the sound um, wave source move. Um, let's have it move towards the observer, positive velocity at some fraction, so it's in units of speed of sound. Um, so I think if I make the source move at something like, a, so this is 50% of speed of sound, so it's actually pretty fast. Um, in the real world terms, sound waves uh, move at about 340 meters per second. So here the source is moving at something like 170 meters per second. In terms of miles per hour, that's like 300 miles per hour. So we are talking about something like a small airplane, something that's moving very fast. So for so if you imagine this is the source that started out from some air here, so at this position is where it emitted this uh, sound wave that's represented by this wave front. And you can see that by the time this second wave was emitted, the source moved here. And as it's emitting this third wave front, it's moved here. So let me play for a bit. So, so you can see the pattern build up here. So on the right side of the source, um, as the source emits the wave front each time, it's getting closer to the previous wave front it's emitted. So there's a kind of bunching up of the wave front on the right side of the source. So when the stationary observer is listening to the sound, then, then the sound is at a higher frequency. Oh, I guess the simulation is saying it's at 100 hertz. So that's what the observer hears. Now, if the observer is on the other side, then as you can see from this wider spacing, 
you can uh, you you can uh, you can see that this observed frequency will shift. Let me just continue running this step by step. And once the source passes the observer, then now the frequency shifts. Instead of hearing a higher frequency, the observer hears the lower frequency. And actually, that's the uh, video that's linked from the lecture page that I think I can play now to, <laughs> to illustrate. Uh, let me do this. I'm going to share my computer sound and optimize for video clip. I'll remember to turn that off. Okay. Okay, unmute, and let me just play through 30 seconds. That ambulance is probably moving at something like 10, 20 miles per hour, maybe 30. Uh, 30 is probably say 20 miles per hour so um so it's uh, that moving a lot slower than how uh, how i was simulating the simulation um because that's uh, only like 10 20 uh, meters per second but um but our ears are sensitive enough that you can hear that difference um shifting from i don't know uh, 800 hertz to uh, 750 hertz and the difference here is uh, difference in the simulation is a lot more dramatic. And one advantage of simulation is that it can also demonstrate some things that um, that uh, not as uh, maybe a little bit harder to um, uh, well that I can find the videos of. <laughs> so here you are seeing Doppler effect in the scenario where the source is moving. Uh, you can visualize it like how the simulation showed and. It's great. If that, I hope that all makes sense. Let's look at a couple more um, slightly less intuitive setup. So we are going to go back to making the source stationary because we worked with the moving source. So let's just have the source stationary. And let's have the observer move. So have the observer move towards the source. So negative velocity at half the speed of sound. So this time it's the observer who's moving at something like uh, 300 miles per hour. So let me just play it for a bit at a normal speed. And after a bit, I'll just step through. So this is how it looks. Now, as you look at this, you might think, um, so this spacing hasn't changed. Um, so why is it that observer is hearing a different frequency? You have to think through the time between the wave front for the observer. So let's say observer is um, crossing this wave front here. And now the, if the observer just stayed at this point, the uh, amount of time it takes for the next wave front to reach this point will be same as what you'd expect for 100 hertz. But the observer doesn't stay stationary as the other wave front is coming towards the observer the observer is moving towards that wave front so they meet together somewhere here at an earlier time than than when the yeah at, at an earlier time when the the this wave front would have met observer if the observer remained stationary so a shorter period shorter time between the wave front means higher frequency and that's what you see here. Emitted frequency is 100 hertz. Observed frequency is 150 hertz. Let me just play through. And once the observer gets to the other side, then the observed frequency is lower. You can kind of see why. So let's see here. Um, oh, that wave front already crossed the observer. So, OK, here, this wave front is crossing the observer. And if the observer stayed here, then this uh, next wave front will hit the observer around the time when you expect a hundred hertz wave to hit hit them but um, because the observer is moving away by the time the next wave uh, is able to catch up with the observer it, the observer has moved this distance so the observed frequency is less now if you're paying careful attention to these numbers you might have noticed that um, these numbers changed 
as in when you had the scenario where the the so let me bring it back to the previous scenario where the observer was stationary and the source was moving at half the speed of sound the higher frequency was a double and the lower frequency wasn't quite half but uh, i don't know six seven so i guess that's two-thirds that's what you saw in the case when the observer was uh, the source was moving now let's change it back to where source is stationary and observer is moving towards the source when the the high frequency is not double it's i guess three halves and the lower frequency is not two thirds it's half now oh i haven't tried it in this simulation before so i don't know quite what it'll give me so um what i hope uh, those who are curious will Try is so. What happens if uh, both the the source and the observer are moving? So if they are moving towards each other, then I think you can imagine the Doppler effect will be larger than what it was when one of them was moving. But what if they are both moving but in the same direction? Let's give that a try. So let me have the source moving to the right at half the speed of sound. And let me move the observer also to the right at half the speed of sound. So when you have that, okay, yeah, um, the simulation is wrong, I think. Because <laughs> um, is it wrong? It might not be wrong. Um, well, I thought there should be a still a bit of a shift. Um, well, um, we can work through that with uh, some formulas in the textbook. Uh, but I, I think uh, one thing that's still, oh, okay, this part I should have tested before. I'm not quite sure uh, this might could be right. But I, I think one thing that's uh, even so that's good to note is that the exact amount of shift it depends on whether it's a source moving or it's observer moving. So because this is something that someone who's physically astute might intuitively think. Someone might intuitively, intuitively think that these two physical pictures are the same, where the, the source is moving towards the observer at some speed. You might think that's the same situation where the observer is moving towards the source at the same speed. But you can clearly see in this simulation that um, they are not the same. You observe one frequency in one scenario, and in the other scenario where one might intuitively think is analogous or similar to the other setup, you observe a different frequency. And this is something that's more um, useful and salient to note uh, when we do in physics 4C, <laughs> when you do special relativity about how there's no special inertial reference frame. Um, here, what it is demonstrating at a minimum is that when you are dealing with the sound wave, there is a special frame where things are at rest. And it does make a difference whether it's the source moving relative to that reference frame or the observer moving relative to that reference frame. And that inertial, re the the reference frame where things are at rest that's the reference frame of air the in the reference frame where air is at rest that's the frame relative to which you measure all your velocity so these two physical pictures one where the source was moving versus one where the observer was moving those are two distinct uh, pictures and all the illustrations in this simulation is done in the reference frame where the air is still. That's why it does make a difference whether the source is at rest or um, relative to the air <laughs> or not. So um, so your textbook has a, a set of formulas that are derived. And let me see if uh, <laughs> my own intuition was off because for some reason I thought, when they were both moving um, in the same direction, then there should still be some shift. But it's possible that I got that wrong. So let's uh, take a look at your textbook. Um, this is one of those formulas that I don't have perfectly memorized, at least uh, 
shake enough that I wouldn't just uh, recall it from memory. So let me just look it up here. It's in your section 17.7, .7, the Doppler effect. And, um, and you know, it has all these illustrations. And it, I think they do the derivation. They do the derivation for how much shift in wavelength there is. And based on that, they um, drive the formula. I encourage you to um, read through that derivation. For our purposes, I'm just going to copy those formulas and um, use it. So it drives uh, uh, two different formulas. And it's uh, important to note what conditions apply for each formula. And there's a indication within the derived formula for that. So it says uh, when a source is, source is moving and observer is stationary. And the indicator there is that they are telling you the velocity of the, uh, of the source, the S stands for source. So let me just write that out. So source moving. And the observed frequency is equal to the source frequency times the speed of the sound divided by speed of the sound. And this minus plus sign relates to whether the source is moving towards the observer or away from observer. Minus plus, uh, let's see here. Do they say which sign? Um, uh, top sign is for source approaching the observer, so minus when source is moving towards the observer, and bottom sign is for source away from the observer. So this is one formula for Doppler shift, and because of that asymmetry I was describing, there's a second formula for when the observer is moving and source is stationary, and that they go through this consideration again, um, I encourage you to <laughs> follow this derivation on your own. And this is the formula. So with the, um, the observed frequency, uh, let me, so this is the scenario where the observer is moving, then observed frequency is the source frequency times, and, and you see that the the terms that are being modified is different. So um, so it's the um, the the factors on the numerator that are getting changed for some reason. Uh, speed of the sound plus minus speed of the observer divided by speed of sound. And let's see. Look at the sign here. Top sign plus is for observer approaching the source. That makes sense. When the numerator is greater, the observed frequency is greater. So so that's. A, so with the Doppler shift, you have to watch out for that. You have to first to note, um, is it the source moving or the observer moving? And depending on which of the two is happening, you have to use appropriate formula. Um, and you can do this. So yeah, and, and so if, if you are combining this into one equation, then that would be uh, what they have here. and. What I want to, oh, uh, there's not enough room there. So this combined into one expression is this. That all looks fine. V plus minus V observer divided by V minus plus V source. Um, now, so I guess according to this formula, then yeah, it must be my intuition that was off. Because if you go back to here and imagine recreating the scenario, uh, this is the scenario that confused me, then you have this situation where the, the speed of the source and the observer are the same. And, um, and, so V O and V S have the same magnitude. The source is moving towards the observer, so it's a minus a sign for the denominator, and the observer is moving away from the source, so it's also minus sign for the numerator. So these factors cancel out, and source and observer frequencies are the same. Hmm. Yeah. So I guess it's. Uh, um, do they give? So they don't give you the formula for wavelength. And um, 
<laughs> I think that's prudent, especially in a scenario where your observer is moving. I think uh, trying to talk about wavelength could, uh, <laughs> it's a, a mess that I'd rather not touch. So, so let me just leave that there. So um, if uh, both uh, source and the observer are moving together, then yeah, the observed, um, observed frequency is the same as the source frequency. Although I had to put a little asterisk there. Um, okay, so I think uh, that's uh, enough for the one homework question you have. Let me just uh, end with uh, by with a demonstration of a uh, shock wave front. So this is uh, something special that happens when the uh, speed of the source, not the observer, exceeds a particular value. So, I, I mean, I guess uh, something weird could also happen if the observer velocity exceeds this value, but um, let's say for simplicity's sake, we're dealing with a stationary observer. That's usually the case for this scenario. And uh, let me put the source way back so that there's enough of a distance. So this is the special scenario. Um, and you can kind of watch this here. I'm going to set source velocity at higher and higher velocity approaching some value. So this is in units of speed of sound. Let me make it faster and faster up to a value. So 10% of speed of sound, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Okay, uh, I can go up to 90. Uh, 90. So at ninety percent of speed of sound, you see something happening here. The wave fronts at front they start bunching up really close together, and the observed frequency is actually getting pretty high. And if you think back to the the Doppler shift formula for um, so moving source, as this velocity, the speed of the source starts to approach the speed of sound, something's happening with the denominator there. So you might wonder uh, what happens if these two numbers are the same so that you are dividing by zero. Well, this happens. And <laughs> um, I, I guess if the ob observer is directly in front of the source, then it's going to get hit. So let's imagine an observer who is slightly away then you can see that the kind of sound wave an observer who's here would hear is a little bit different from the kind of the sound waves that someone who's here would hear. Uh, because uh, right now, we do this 60% uh, of speed of sound, it's just regular sound, nothing unusual. And, but when it's uh, equal to the speed of sound, then this uh, bunched up wave front, they extend it down to here. So what you can imagine is an observer who's here is going to um, feel the effect of all those um, wave fronts constructively interfering at the same time. And that's what's uh, referred to as a sonic boom or the shock wave, because when all those wave fronts are hitting you at the same time, it's quite loud. <laughs> and the one um, or Mach 1 is a bit of a special speed. I think there's a lot of instability there, as you can imagine, division by zero. So let me actually uh, move it off to the other side. Make the source move at one and a half times the speed of sound. Uh, that uh, gives a more cl cleaner illustration of the shock wave. So, um, Oh, I, I gotta know when to pause it. Let me pause it at the right time. So these wave fronts look qualitatively different from previous wave fronts. So uh, for one, the source will reach the observer before the observer even knows that source is coming. I mean, if they see it, then they will see. But the source observer will only hear the source after it's passed. And for on, imagine someone who's down here. So this is the representation of the shock wave front. And this is the front where all these different wave fronts have constructively interfered. So as this passes through whoever's down here, they will hear a very loud sound in a very short duration of time. That's the sonic boom. And that's why supersonic airplanes are banned from airports near the population centers because they are quite loud and there's not a lot of things you can do to stop them from being loud. 
And, and, and that's the illustration of shock wave. And that's what happens when the source moves faster than the speed of wave. Uh, this happens with the sound wave, quite obviously. And you can also hear it from time to time <laughs> um, when you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, and this can also happen with the light waves. It, uh, so with the light waves, you need a very specific setup because uh, light in vacuum is the fastest thing. So nothing will move faster than that. But line in a light in a transparent medium uh, it is not necessarily traveling at the same speed as vacuum. So in medium like water or glass, a uh, source of light wave, like electron, can move faster than speed of light in that medium. And you can get a light shock wave that's similar to this. So, so I, I think that covers all the stuff about wave, sound waves that I've avoided lecturing on in the past. Let me just see uh, what else is there that I should have 